human nature, not, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case, open and shut No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut Today we'll go bird watching, tomorrow we'll catch toads The next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut Well, I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things And I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case Open and shut No doubt about it I'm a nature nut Greetings, fellow nature nuts, and welcome to the magnificent coastal forests of British Columbia. I'm here in Goldstream Provincial Park, and any of you who have ever been to the magnificent coastal forests of British Columbia, especially if you've camped here, you know what you remember most, the slugs. This is a great place for slugs, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go looking for slugs, as well as snails, which are really just kind of slugs with shells. Anyway, we'll get to that. They are members of the animal group called mollusks, the phylum mollusca. And it's a wonderful group. It includes not only snails and slugs, but also clams, limpets, cuttlefish, squid, octopi, all sorts of strange things that mostly live in salt water. But the one group of mollusks that has made it up onto land is the group that includes the slugs and the snails, the gastropods, they're called. And you know what gastropod means? It means stomach foot. Gastro means stomach, pod means foot. Their foot, the thing that they walk on, if you can call it walking, it's not like our foot at all. It's like a great big slimy rubber surfboard and it lies along their belly. That's why they're called stomach foot. It really should be belly foot. And they kind of surf through the world on their slimy belly foot, very slowly, riding the waves of the forest floor. It's a beautiful thing to see. Now I've only been here for a couple of hours and I've only found one species of slug so far. It's a small one, it's about the size of the slugs back home, but it's a really nifty one because it has golden slime. Sort of golden yellow, you look on the side of the slug and it has little yellow beads on it. Very lovely, different species of slug, different colors of slime. They were originally going to call this Gold Slime Provincial Park, but then they decided to name it after the gold stream that runs through the park, full of spawning salmon. It's quite something, but pff, let's ignore that. Let's go look for slugs instead. Well, aren't we lucky? It's a perfect day for slugs. You know, out here on the coast, people are always saying, nice weather if you're a duck. But I don't think ducks like this weather any better than we do. It's nice weather if you're a slug. They love it when it's rainy and gloomy and miserable because they can get out and wander around. They're not going to dry out. This is the kind of day that you want to spend looking for slugs. Let's take this opportunity to review basic slug structure, the external anatomy of your average slug. Let's start with the head. And you can see on the front of the head, there are two sets of tentacles, feelers. And the top ones, which are also the longer ones, they have a little dot at the end of them, and that dot is actually an eye. It's not a very good eye. I mean, you can look them in the eye, but they can't really look you in the eye because they can't see very well. That's why they're always poking their eyes into little grass blades and things and sucking the whole tentacle back into their head. The next set of tentacles, or the other set of tentacles, the lower set of tentacles are the sensory tentacles and they just use those to feel around to decide whether what they're bumping into is something to eat or something to just cruise on over. Underneath on the head there's the mouth. Behind the head there's a big sort of saddle shaped patch and that is the mantle. And the mantle is a structure that all mollusks have, but it's a mysterious structure because it never looks the same in any two mollusks. 
In some, it secretes the shell. In slugs, it's just kind of a saddle-shaped patch. If you were a miniature slug cowboy, that's where you'd set on this slug to ride it across the forest floor. If you are a miniature slug cowboy, by the way, drop me a line. I'll make sure you get a chance to appear on the show. On the right side of the mantle, there's a hole. And you might think that the slug had been wounded or shot or something. It looks really gross. But that hole is actually the opening to the slug's lung. They have a single lung and they breathe air like you and I. They don't breathe in and out like, like that. They just breathe very slowly because they're not using a lot of energy in their slug lifestyle. But that's the breathing hole. Underneath the mantle, that's where the stuff that you'd usually expect at the back of the animal, the anus and the genital opening, they're underneath the mantle. You can't see them right now, which is probably good. Apart from that, what else can I show you? I can show you this ridge down the middle of the back, and that is called the keel. It's also called the carina. That's very typical in biology. There's two names for everything. Just in case you think you're, you know, a smart person for memorizing the first name, then they surprise you with the second name, the keel or the carina. And then along the bottom of the slug, the whole bottom surface is called the foot. You can see how the edge of the foot flares out a bit. That's called the skirt. I guess we could also call it the kilt. Two names for everything. And there you have your basic slug. It's a fantastically weird critter that is perfectly adapted to its environment, especially on a day like today, perfect for slugs. There are carnivorous snails that use their radula mouth to drill right through the shells of other mollusks. Well, here is a really neat little biology demonstration that you can do the next time you have a rainy day at the campsite. Have you ever wondered how those slugs move? It's a mysterious thing, isn't it? Well, in order to figure it out, you have to see the slug from the underside. You can't, uh, you can't see the critical things looking down on them. So, what you need is a fully articulated Sluggo Vision viewing panel. And uh, do we have one of those uh, here? One moment. There we are. <laughs> okay. And you put a slug on top of this, uh, this panel, just basically a piece of glass. Get her in a good position. And then you watch very carefully on the underside of the slug. Okay, wake up there, slug. Coast is clear. Okay, starting to move. And right in the middle of the body, on the underside of the slug, there are dark bands, dark waves, and those are muscle contractions. Wave after wave of muscle contractions, and the slug is actually pushing itself along on its own slime trail. It produces the slime, and when the slime comes in contact with water, it thickens, it becomes more viscous, and the slug is able to propel itself along with those waves of muscle contractions, one after another, in perfect harmony. Oh, it's so soothing. You know, this would be a good uh, stress relief therapy for overworked executives, people like that. You could set one of these up in your office and close the door and get them to hold your calls. By the time the slug crawled off the panel, you'd be ready to face the challenges of that weird world out there. That's not a bad idea. Actually, I could make a lot of money with that. Take it around the country, do weekend workshops. But you know, I'm more interested in showing you about slugs. Wave after wave, from the head to the tail.
would be a good spot to look. All right. You know, I'm new to this slug thing, so I've asked Dave Fraser to help me out. He's the Biodiversity Extension Specialist with the British Columbia Ministry of in the Environment, Lands, and Parks. It's a very impressive title. Much better than Nature Nut. More syllables anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, it's very, it is very impressive. So, are these slug-chewed mushrooms? They then? are slug-chewed yeah. mushrooms. You can see the uh, cap's been chewed at here. And that's a really important job that, that uh, slugs do in our forest is they move spores around, particularly for mycorrhizal fungi, which are important in tree root connections. Right, form partnerships with the tree roots and help right. the forest, yeah. Yep. So, if we snap these off, we should be able to see who did this, if they're still around. Oh, Somebody's there's one. There's one. There's one there and there's some. Oh man, look at that. Yeah, the mother load. Right on, Slug City. Slug City. So we've got um, three different species here. This is a uh, gold slime slug you found the first, day, first time you were in the park. Um, what, what's its real name? Profeseon andersonii. Profeseon andersonii. Lovely, beautiful name. Beautiful piece you of said cake. That nicely. And then this black one here is called a European furrowed slug, um, or sometimes a black velvet slug or a licorice slug. It's a really bad garden pest. It eats a lot of um, vegetables and flowers in people's gardens. It also uh, can be really aggressive to native slugs um, and, and can kill and eat them. These two are both banana slugs, two different color morphs. This one's got no spot. And here's a one with lots of spots. Very banana. -y. You can see why it looks like a rotting banana. If you like your bananas bruised, this is the one you want to get. <laughs> yeah. And of course, you know the story that about every slug's called Pat? No. The slugs are both male and female. They all go by the name Pat. <laughs> and when they reproduce, both both partners in the mating go away, at least the first time they mate, with fertile eggs. So they actually produce a fair number of offspring. Wow. Look at all the slime down there too. Yeah, the slime is, is the slime here is an amazing stuff. There's um, banana slugs produce at least seven different types of slime. The strongest one is one that's produced on the tail pit and um, they can use that to lower themselves down a couple of meters out of the trees. So if they need to get, they've been foraging up in the trees at night, need to get down before the sun dries them out, they can just lower themselves down on the slime. Rather than just jump. Uh, yeah, jumping's a messy business for a slime. You don't want to see it. No, they lower themselves down. In rainforests, some snails are found right up at the tops of trees. Well, yigga digga digga, look at that. That's a land snail. You know, for a guy like me from the prairies, it's always a thrill to see a land snail and I'm always surprised. I don't know why I'm surprised, I shouldn't be surprised. After all, there are over 28,000 species of land snails and land slugs on this planet. They're everywhere, apparently. But it always surprises me to know that there are snails on land. This is a particularly nifty land snail. I mean, not only is it cute, but this one, Vespericola columbiana, also has hairs on the outside of the shell. I don't know why, maybe to discourage predators, but that's the first time I've ever seen a hairy snail, and I'm a little bit excited. Most of the land snails around here are not snails at all, they're slugs, because it's difficult to be a land snail in an environment like this, because the forests around here, they're mostly very acidic from the breakdown of coniferous tree needles, and it's difficult in an acidic environment for a snail to get the calcium it needs together to build a shell. The shell is made out of uh, calcium carbonate. So, many of these lineages of land snails have become land slugs instead, and a slug is just basically a snail without the shell. Marvelous things, these land snails. Lovely, 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 lovely. Some snails host part of the life cycle of parasites that can affect people. One example is swimmer's itch. You know, most people who have an aquarium at home will have at least a few snails in there, either by accident or they'll get one or two snails just for fun. I've set up this tank primarily for the snails. The fish are 
the accidental ones, a couple of guppies in there. But I want you to have a look at these snails because I find them really, really interesting. Most of the ones in here are ram's horn snails, and they were born in this aquarium. Their parents have long since passed away, but they're majestic critters. The spiral of the shell is a flat spiral, and for that reason, they look kind of like the horn of a big horn sheep. If you look at them closely, they are just as magnificent as a bighorn sheep in their own way, with their sort of splotchy foot and mantle, their lovely little eyeballs, the long tentacles, and their mustache-like faces. They're really good-looking snails. I feed them algae wafers, by the way. You can buy algae wafers at the pet store because there's not enough natural algae in this tank to keep them well-fed. They're, they're really quite voracious. I also have to keep them with plastic aquarium plants because they would just eat real aquarium plants. I've also got a huge apple snail in here. It's the size of an apple. It looks a lot like the ram's horn snails, but the spiral of the shell goes out to the side a bit. And this thing is just so big. I love watching it. It's very soothing. It's more soothing than fish watching, to my mind, because everything is kind of slow motion with these snails, if you know what I mean. And the final one I want you to notice is that uh, lovely golden mystery snail back there. It's not a color form that occurs in nature. They've been specially bred for the aquarium trade. Lovely snails, beautiful snails, and somewhat mysterious. In the pet store world, these apple snails are often called mystery snails. All of them. I wondered why this was. I asked dozens of pet store people. No one knew. I figured the mystery was the name itself. You call something a mystery snail, it becomes mysterious. I finally found part of the answer in this book, Apple Snails in the Aquarium by Dr. Gloria Pereira and Jerry G. Walls. It turns out the original mystery snail was a European snail, not closely related to the apple snail, and the name, mystery snail, is over 200 years old. So we still don't know what was so mysterious 200 years ago. It's a question science cannot answer. Anyway, I can recommend this book. It's the only book I know of that tells you how to keep snails healthy in the aquarium. It's a very interesting book. It also has a unique feature I've never seen before in a pet book. At the back, there are two recipes in case you decide you'd rather eat your apple snails uh, rather than keeping them alive. It's a unique feature. I doubt it's gonna be much of a trend in pet books. Apple snails can be pests in tropical places, eating crops and spreading parasites. Snails are so weird in shells. They dwell, they dig, they climb. <laughs> on their belly, a foot, they glide, they ride on slime. Yeah. They're moving slow. Oh, where do they go? Smoothly, they flow most of the time. What's the mystery with the mystery snail? It ain't no mystery at all. Oh, what's the mystery with the mystery snail? They lay their eggs up on the walls. Oh, why? Oh, what's the mystery with the mystery snail? Don't trust that look there in their eye. Oh. Look through the glass and watch the mystery snail. Don't let the mystery pass you by. Big slugs, they hug the ground around, out in the rain. Banana slug, the forest floor is your domain. You know it. <laughs> You're so ugly, hey, can't you see? You're driving me insane.
Hi, how's it going? Don't go changing. <laughs> How are you? Hey, how's that steak anyway? It looks good. Slugs in the garden in the vegetable patch. Oh, slugs out in the forest in the wild. They eat whatever they can hunt down and catch. A tasty leaf's what makes them smile. I got it. Whoever thought that a banana slug would look exactly like its name? A piece of fruit could sprout some tentacles and look an awful lot the same. A banana! Radula face, a mollusk, a shell, well, it's a snake. A lung unsung down there, no hair, don't hug a slug. They are so odd, onward they plod, the gastropod, the snail. Ladies and gentlemen, the snail. Thank you. You know, after spending time with the magnificent snails and slugs of the West Coast, I can hardly wait to get back home and admire the little tiny land snails and the little gray slugs in the garden that I've been ignoring up till now. That's the great thing about seeing the truly magnificent in nature. It makes you appreciate the common things in nature. But before we go, I have to tell you that there is the great ancestral home of all mollusks. That's where they evolved. That's where the greatest diversity of mollusks is. It's the briny deep. I like calling it the briny deep because I'm from Alberta. Out here, they don't call it the briny deep. They call it the ocean or they call it the marine environment. But there are lots of mollusks out there. Maybe someday we'll come back and have a look at them. That's the great thing about being a nature nut. You never run out of things to have a look at. I'm a nature nut, and I hope you are too. We'll see you again next time. Briny Deep. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. <laughs>